have with us uh, Fabiola Eichelser. She is really an expert and thought leader in agile, lean people operations. She's a CEO of Just Leading Solutions that's based in New York City. And we are so, so happy to have her here this evening to talk to us and share her expertise. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Fabiola. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure being here. And we're talking tonight about stepping outside the box, even though I was told I have to stay within this blue box here. So I'll do my best to, to do that. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, it should be on. Is it on? Um, Thank you so much for coming out tonight to talk about HR. I know it's not the most sexy topic, but we're going to change that uh, tonight. But first of all, let me ask, do we, do we have any HR people in the room? Please stand up. <laughs> OK, give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, just a couple of words before we get started. If you want to download uh, the slides, um, they are on, on SlideShare. Net, you can either search for my name or for um, DC Enterprise Agile List and, and you will find uh, the slides. And for people who join us um, online, if you have any questions, just post them on Twitter and we make sure to answer them um, at the end of the, of the session. So we're going to talk about Agile HR or as it's more accurate, Agile People Operations. Um, and why do we say people? It's, that's actually the core of our organizations. But if we look at organizations today, if we look at our workspace today, 88% of people are not passionate about their work. Seven in 10 IT workers are stressed out and, and think about leaving their job on a regular basis. This engagement costs our organization $500 billion a year just because we don't trigger people. And that comes at a time when we actually know that great vision without great people is nothing. So people are the really limiting resources in a time that is just really volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And we know today that the currency for competitiveness is talent, knowledge, and leadership. And if an organization cannot get ahead of these topics, they're not going to win in the workspace. Um, and of course, people are the life and soul of our organizations, and that's the way we should treat them. They are not resources, they are people. Um, and that means that HR gets onto the map like never before. The term HR has been around since 1893, and we've gone, undergone a lot of changes in those times, but we've never ever had such a transformation as we are needing today because all time thinking is not going to fix the issues that we face at the workspace. Um, but actual HR is a, is a reality today. If we look at those trends from, from this year, um, HR Today says HR embraces Agile. Number one trend for HR. HR drives the Agile organization, or 2016, to welcome the acceleration of Agile adoption outside IT. So this is a reality, and the sooner um, your organization, the sooner you get on board, the, the better you get ahead of, of, of that and can embrace um, agility. Um, when we talk about HR, the first thing that people say is like, oh, no, please, don't let us talk to HR. We don't want to get involved there. Um, let me point out a couple of realities about HR. These are the things that we hear. Anyone can do HR, or HR just lives in their bubble, or HR aren't the sharpest tax in the box, and everyone hates HR. Um, but that's unjustified. And the reason why you f we think like that actually comes from this. A lot of the things that we do in HR are dictated by hidden forces, especially finance and legal. If you look at hiring freezes, it's not an invention of HR to say, hey, I know you need uh, someone in that role, but it's October, you're not allowed to hire anyone anymore. It's not HR that wants that. It's finance that comes in and says, hey, we didn't calculate the way we, we wanted it to be. Now you're going to stop hiring. And if you have someone who is not the right person in the job, you better keep that person because you're not going to uh, be able to fill that position again. That's not HR. That's finance. And if we look at legal, legal is really dominating the HR space today. And if you go to any HR conference, there is always a lot of uh, talk, talk about legal. If we look at hiring processes, what are they optimized for? They are optimized 
to handle rejection. It's not about finding the best person. It's really about making sure that if we don't take someone on board, that we're not open for lawsuits. And today, 5% of, of litigation against organizations are employment um, or have to do with, with HR. Um, so we have to get on, on top of that. And because legal dominates um, the HR space, we're not allowed to have that honest discussion anymore. It, it's all scripted. But how can we have a personalized, individualized discussion if it's fully scripted? So we have to get, to get on top of, of that. Another thing is that a lot of the things that we do in HR are to handle poor performance and mediocrity. If you think about the best person you've ever worked with, and you think about the HR processes you would put in place to deal with that one person, the HR processes will look completely differently. But we're handling it to make sure that we get the low performer and, and drag them on uh, for another couple of years and, and things like that. So we handle mediocrity. We're not handling the best people. And another part is that we have to make up for weak managers and uninspiring leaders. If you look at performance management, which is the most um, despised uh, practice um, out there today, um, it start, when we have those forced rankings where you have to say like 10% or your bottom 10% and, and you, you categorize uh, people, where does it actually come from? It comes from the realization that managers did not differentiate in their feedback. They just gave everyone the same rating because it was the most comfortable thing to do. And they just said, hey, no, that's not what we want. We want you to give actual feedback, feedback people can use. That's why they come up with, came up with forced ranking. And we know it didn't pan out the way it was intended. But the, the source of it was actually um, from uninspiring leaders. And um, it costs our economy $360 billion a year, uninspiring leadership. So those are huge numbers. So we have to say no more. It's really time for, for Lean Agile um, people operations. So what is it? Um, Lean Agile people operations is really about inspiring and engaging pe um, people and really create places of work where they can thrive. And of course, HR people today or HR pros or people pros have to understand 21st century employees. And we're going to come back to, the, to that a little bit later on. And HR solutions today um, are made to be fair for everyone. So we are very good at trying to standardize everything and making sure that it's fair for everyone. But by doing that, we're not actually um, being accommodating anymore. We can't be in the future are going to be more accessible, more individualized, and they are going to be co-created. Managers and employees are going to have a voice on how we're going to do things. It's not just prescriptive uh, from the organization. Okay, what is Agile HR? It actually has two components, and that's quite an important thing when you discuss uh, these topics with, with HR to, to keep in mind. On the one hand, we have the Agile HR organization itself. So how can, uh, can the HR organization be organized in natural way of working? So you would have your scrum teams and Kanban teams and, and Kanban boards and, and all that stuff in there. So that's actually how are they organized, how do they work, how do they set up interdisciplinary teams, how do they embrace new roles in HR. Um, and the other part, and that's the part that you're probably experiencing more and, and where you feel the pain points, is actually the HR solutions. How can um, recruitment, how can performance management, um, how can career paths be done in a natural mindset? And that's the part that, that uh, organizations need to fix. And of course, those two go hand in hand. Um, but typically, when we talk about actual HR, what people have in mind is the actual HR solutions. But what they think how to approach it is just by implementing Scrum in HR. But it's two different, uh, two different ways. One is, how are we working? And the other one is, what are our HR practices? What do they look like? How can we bring an actual mindset? How can we bring actual values? Do that. And the biggest part here is trust. How do we embed trust? And if you read um, a company statements, it talks a lot about trusting people. But when it comes to our practices, it, it's a different thing. Um, to give you an example, the, um, the pharmaceutical company Roche, um, what they did is they made an experiment and said, OK, we're going to trust our people with expenses. So we're going to trust that they make the right decision 
um, for our business when it comes to expenses. The only thing they had to do is uh, to put it up online and it was visible to, to everyone in, in, in the team how much uh, they put onto their expense report. What happened as a result? Their costs went down by 30%, their expenses. And that's not taking into consideration all the amount of, um, of time it would have taken to check off all those expense reports. Just by trusting people and telling them, OK, do whatever you think is right, actually help them uh, make those decisions. Because it was no longer, you have the right to do this or that. It was no longer prescriptive. So we have to build in uh, trust into our systems. Um, let us look at a couple of different practices um, or how we are going to em embrace that. Um, I clustered it in eight different topics. The first two are more the philosophy behind it, and the other six are, um, are actual practices. Okay, it's, um, it's all about embracing the new talent contract. What do we mean by that? Um, McGregor, um, in the 1960s, so this, this concept is not new, in the 1960s he said, we're going to cluster people in two different categories. We have people X, those are the people who are lazy and you have to force them to work and you have to control them and, and they're definitely not intrinsically motivated. You have to throw money at them in order for them to do anything. Um, and the other category is type Y people. They are intrinsically motivated. Um, they thrive on a challenge. Um, they want to be part of something great. Um, and those are the people that we have today in our organizations. Those are the knowledge workers. Those are the learning workers. They want to be in control. They want to be in the driver's seat when it comes uh, to the way they work and, and the way they engage. And Agile embraces that way of working like no other. Um, we empower people, we authorize them to do stuff, but we have to bring the same mindset into our HR organization. And what does that mean? If we look at um, learning and development, if we look at talent management, that means the employee's in the driver's seat. If an employee wants to learn um, about the new programming language or wants to do something, they do it. It's not HR that comes in and, and tells them, okay, you have three courses a year, here's the catalog, just pick it. Of course, HR still provides uh, the platforms and, and, and provides the access, but it's up to the employee to say, hey, I'm someone who learns by, by watching small um, video sessions, or I'm someone who needs the classroom interaction. The people are in the driver's seat, and that's a huge difference in the way we, we do business. Then the other part is that we have to create inspiring places of work and foster continuous engagement. And I've already mentioned at the beginning that this engagement costs us $500 billion. So we have to fix that. And people who are engaged, who are passionate about what they do, and who identify themselves with the organization, um, they, are, um, they are more productive. They are um, organizations who have a, um, an engaged workforce have a 2.5 um, times higher um, annual net revenue than organization who, who don't have an engaged um, organization. So this really translates into, into tangible, uh, in, into, into business as access. Oops, that's, <laughs> thank you, Christine. Um, so we have to take care, um, care of engagement. And when we talk um, with HR people, you often hear the term um, en uh, retention and retain people. That is not a term you're going to hear in actual people operations. Because we don't want to retain people. We want them to thrive. We want them to open up. Um, and how, what's the best way to um, reduce re retention or um, reduce turnover? It's investing in people. And if you invest <coughs> in people and keep their market value up, they're, going to stay, they're more likely to stay with your organization. And for a lot of managers, that's a little bit difficult to wrap their heads around because they think like if we invest in people and they get a higher market value, then they are more attractive for, for um, competitors and they, those competitors are going to take away our people. But it's actually quite the opposite because um, people make a, a decision to stay with your organization because they get the same opportunities with you than they would at someone else's place. Because today, a lot of people leave because they say, OK, I don't have a growth potential <coughs> with my company. They don't invest in, in my learning and development enough. I'm going to move to another company where I can take on a new job, where I can, can do other stuff, where I can learn more. 
And if you invest in people, you take that away. So we're not talking about retention. It doesn't mean that we're not caring, that we don't care about um, having people uh, within the organization, but it's all about in engagement. Okay, now let's look at a couple of practices. Um, hiring, it's, it's a, obviously a huge topic because that's the way you, you actually build a strong workforce, by hiring the right people. And hiring doesn't start the minute you have a job opening. It starts long before. You have to connect with your audience, with, you, with your potential talent pool, long before you have a position, a position <laughs> open. And if you look at, at retention, uh, at, um, at recruitment today, eight in 10 organizations already have difficulty filling <coughs> positions. And it's, um, hiring costs went up 15% over the past four years. So these are, are, are strong things. And we have to, um, um, to put in, uh, to engage, uh, to, sorry, um, we have to invest in employment branding. We have to tell people that we employ the best way of working, that we are working in an actual manner. So we have to engage with people, we have to have a, a, good, um, a good branding. And then when people come on board, we have to hire people and not paper. We have a tendency to just look at resumes and then hire the person who, has, who is best at rocking the interview. But that might not be the right person for your job. So involve your team and really get to know that person and make sure that you understand or let them tell you and, and give you examples of how they showed agility in, in previous jobs. How did they re what did they do when they realized they were on the wrong track? How, how did they flex their muscles to change that situation? So you wanna know those, situ those things and you wanna include your team in the decision because it's your team that's gonna make them and, and everyone successful. So you have to include your, your team. Um, for instance, Nokia does um, hack, hiring hackathons where they, they invite um, candidates or, or potential candidates to participate in something like that. And if you work with someone for a day in a hackathon, you know if you can work together with that person and you know if, if they are a fit or not. So we have to make sure that we get that right because if it's not a fit, the team can't be, uh, can't be successful. Um, and then, of course, we have to rock at onboarding. Agile teams are great at getting people up to speed because from the first second you step into that door, you're part of that team and you're being engaged. You know what you work at. You feel the power of Agile. But we're sort of missing out on the time between signing the contract and getting them into the door. And that's a period of time that we have to utilize. Uh, what the company called, uh, the company Honkemöller, what they do is they have an app. The minute you sign a contract, you get access to that app and they have different video clips and, and learning nuggets and learning sessions on that app. And people do that beforehand. So they do part of the onboarding before they actually start working. And it's a great mm -hmm. way of engaging people. And they go out and tell their friends and their family, hey, look, this is my company. Look at how great that is. And they feel that they know, already know the organization. So you don't have to stick them into, into um, or onboarding programs where you tell them about the company. They already know that stuff. And mention it to other people. So we have to utilize that, um, that period of time to really pull them in. And if you have a social event, if your team um, does social, invite them to that so that they get to know the people and, and can interact um, already. The next part is performance management. As I mentioned before, the most scrutinized um, practice in, in HR, HR today. 98% of, of managers say it, it just doesn't work. 59% um, of employees say it's a complete waste of time. 90% um, of HR says it, it, the system actually pulls out incorrect data. 30% say um, that the performance actually went down <laughs> after the reviews. So it's not something that uh, works that well. And even if you ask HR people, Sherm, the Society for Human Resource Management, that is in town at the moment with 15,000 um, attendees at the, at the conference, they did a survey and asked their HR people, 
how happy are you with your with your performance management system do you think it really is worth the time and it's a great system and you give it a great a two percent of HR people said yes 98 percent were not happy with the way it was and now if you look at the, the amount of time and money we spend on that process um, Deloitte did a study for themselves and they found out that they spent two million hours a year on performance management. Now imagine what you could do with two million hours. And another study shows that if you're a company with 10,000 people, you, um, your performance management process costs you 35 million a year, every single year. So we spend that amount of money and, and time in a process that is just broken. And we have to stop that. And Agile teams are in a great position to change that um, because the first thing you have to do is realign it for goals because that was what performance management was intended for. It was goals, aligning goals, making sure that we have to change joint effort and that, that everyone works at, um, on the right thing. So I don't have to tell you how that works in, in Agile. So get your performance um, pay period aligned with your iteration. Like if, you do, if you're on a, on a scaled agile train, align it with your PI planning, or if, if you're on, on Scrum iterations, align it with those, those iterations. That's the first part. Then the second part is have the inspiring goals. Agile teams know, know how to take care of that, so we don't have to talk about that um, too much. Then the next one is um, eliminate <coughs> performance appraisals. They are a thing of the past. And this is not just happening for Agile teams. 10% um, of Fortune 500 companies have already eliminated performance appraisals. That doesn't mean that they don't talk about performance, but it's not done in an annual um, review and we don't have forced rankings um, anymore. Um, but what we do is that we embed feedback, continuous <coughs> feedback into the workflow. Um, in Agile teams, you already have your, your um, reviews and your retrospectives where you talk about these things. Um, but of course, managers have to come in and talk with their employees. But it's just about the feedback and about continuous improvement. It's not something that gets reported back to HR because the minute you link feedback to um, merit rounds and bonuses and, and um, uh, promotions and all that stuff, it gets on a different dynamic because it's no longer about the feedback, it's about the implications of that feedback. So if you do that feedback, do it continuously. It's important, that's the only way to thrive and, and, and to improve, but it's not something that gets reported back, back to HR. Um, and of course, dealing with low and underperformance is a leadership um, task, and leaders cannot just push it onto the, the performance appraisal form and say, okay, once a year we do that and everything's being taken care of. No, you have to address these things and you have to address it straight away and deal with that. And if you see that, performance, that we have a performance issue, um, deal with it. And if it's not the right fit for your team for whatever reason, then make a change. Help that person transition into a different team or help them transition outside the organization. But don't drag it out for weeks, months, sometimes even years. Um, a, a study done by, by PricewaterhouseCoopers shows that if you have a team of four people and you have one bad apple in there, um, your productivity level goes down by 30%. So they, they did that for themselves, for a team of, of uh, consultants. It cost them about $125,000 a year just because one person didn't pull it off and they just dragged it out. So if you see it doesn't work out, make the change it, address it. This is a leadership, uh, leadership task. Um, and then of course, continuous pr pr improvement is a key part. Um, and of course, agile teams are great at continuously challenging the situation and, and, <coughs> and pulling that off. Um, but at the same time, HR has to come in and rethink the way we do learning and development. Uh, because it's not just about classroom trainings, it's also about embracing all those new technologies, maybe have little video segments where people can just pull information or um, organizing uh, brown bag sessions or unconferences. So have different ways of approaching people because knowledge workers today are learning workers. 
because knowledge has a half-life uh, time and we have to deal with that. Um, so we have to make sure that we're up to speed with that and we have to teach people um, how knowledge changes and how they can, can stay on top of these things. So this has to be, um, to be a part of yeah. that. Or they could go to a great a HR conference. Absolutely. Or Agile conference. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then we've already talked about um, leadership. And this is a, a key issue. Because in organizations today, we typically promote the person who is, uh, is the best expert, who is best at doing their job. But that may, may or may not be the right person to lead people, to inspire other people, and help those people um, thrive. And we always say, people join companies, but they leave managers or bad managers. Um, and 65% of people actually say they would take a new boss over a pay raise. And 75% of people who leave voluntary, who quit voluntary, they leave because of bosses. And we see um, from studies that if, an, if a manager spends one to six hours every week with their di direct reports, um, those people are 30% more innovative, 29% uh, um, more productive, 15% more engaged. This is, is that, and of course, Asia comes in and helps those people to do it, those managers and leaders. And then we have to take the topic of money off the table. 89% of companies believe that their people are leaving due to money, but it's only actually 12%. Most of the others leave for bad managers. So we have to stay on, on top of that. And we have to bring in more transparency into our salary systems. Um, you might have heard of a company like Buffer who have a salary formula where everyone can just go in and say, okay, this is my role, this is my seniority level, my location, and they can calculate uh, their salary. And there um, are other companies who just open up the whole salary pool so everyone sees the salary of everyone. Some companies have a democratic voting on salaries and, and things like that. And transparent salaries can really um, help to people to understand the salary system and, and actually ensure that if you move into a job or, or switch between jobs, that it depends on your role and not on your negotiation power to actually get a specific salary. But of course, I understand that it's, it's, you have to have your house in order before you can just open up um, your, all your salaries. But the more transparent you can be about your salary system, even if it's just explaining the system or what a, a chemical company did, they gave every employee a salary letter once a year and they told them where they were positioned in their range. They had, had role-based um, ranges. So you would know, okay, I'm 89% to the midpoint and things like that. So the more transparency you can bring in, the better. Keep your house in order in, uh, so that you can um, pull that off. The another part is, uh, bonus, is uh, bonuses. And MBO-based individual bonuses are toxic for Agile teams. Because you cannot go on the whole year telling people it's just about your team performance. And you have to pull it off together. But at the end of the year, we're going to measure exactly what you individually did to make it happen. That doesn't mean that we're not recognizing people. And it doesn't mean that we're not letting them be part or, um, if the company is, is, uh, is pulling something off or, or has, a, has a great win. We, we share that profit. That's a great thing. But it's not on an individual basis. It's on a, on a team or organization-wide uh, basis. Um, and of course, we recognize people. And we have to come up with new ways of doing it. And it has to be a combination between more annual, more expensive, more um, more prestigious um, awards like CEO awards or, or things like that. But it has to be combined with more intimate day-to-day -day recognition that can be given by anyone, not just managers. And we have to combine those two to recognize people. Because at the moment, what happens in our organizations is that we recognize people just through bonuses. And it's a highly expensive, highly ineffective system. Because we're just throwing money at them and then wonder why everyone is rushing after money. So we have to take care of, of these things. 
And another part that goes hand in hand with compensation is benefits. And uh, we have to take care of the health and welfare of people. Because we know that if people are healthy and, and well, they have a 30% higher customer satisfaction rating than other people. And healthcare costs in this country, just alone heart disease health related healthcare costs are 84 billion a year. Um, and we have to take care of these issues because our people are sick, they are stressed out. And we have to make sure that, that, we, uh, that we do that. And studies show that if you spend um, one dollar into a healthcare program or fitness program, uh, your medical costs go down by 3.7 uh, uh, $27, so you have a high ratio there. And last but not least is offer meaningful growth opportunities. So we can no longer go on a system that just ha means career, means climbing a hierarchical ladder. For one, the hierarchical ladder is disappearing, and for another, it's not agile anymore. Um, we are not flexible anymore. Of course, we have to have role-based career paths that we say, okay, if you're Scrum Master, these are all the typical roles that you could take on, um, but we still have to listen to the individual. And we have to have a constant and continuous um, dialogue about that. In nature, we're going to see new roles emerging, like a career agents or career coaches and talent scouts. So career agents are some, is someone who really connects with a person and, and you shape the individual career profile. And if you say, okay, someone wants to be in a managerial role in, within the near future, we're gonna make sure that the development path that that person takes gears them toward, uh, toward that role. But it has to be an open and honest discussion. Because today, if you go to HR and or your manager and tell them, hey, listen, I'm happy where I'm at now, um, but within the next six, nine, 12 months, I'm ready for a next uh, step. It's all the alarm bells go off, but that's not the way of actual people. Actual should, people should be able to address that and then come up with a solution together because the best manager is, is a person who can develop people but then also let them spring, spread their rings <coughs> and move within the organization. And today, often managers keep the best people for themselves because that makes them shine. And we have to change that and, and really create that, that culture of trust. And of course, we need an agile workforce planning so that we are able to move people around. If someone comes in and says, hey, um, I'm sort of stuck where I'm at now. Um, I'm sort of deep into my, my expertise and my skills, and I don't think I can learn that much anymore in that team. I want we need to be able to make that switch. I to go, um, I'll be back in six months. So I'm more accommodating in the way, way we do that. And if we pull that off, then we have an agile people operation system that is just co-created, is, is, is um, more accommodating, and it really embraces the nature of agile people and can help them thrive. So when we change things, it's not just saying we're pulling employee appraisals and everything is fine. It takes a finely calibrated system to, to, to make <coughs> that happen and really change that culture. But anyone who has ever been in, in a natural transformation how knows how quickly that can change. The minute you change something, you just pull in and you experience that power of Agile. And that's gonna be the same, same with HR. There are a lot of things that we think we can't pull off today. The minute you start and you go down, the, down that road, you see the world in, in a different way and you, you feel the power of Agile and can pull it off. Let me just say a couple of words about the Agile HR journey. How do companies uh, start with that? We see that it's typically highly correlated with the actual uh, journey that they are ongoing. So if, if you're just getting started and you have one or two scrum teams, then typically that is not your, your major concern. So you're not talking about HR that much, but the more you scale agile, the more you, you um, embrace uh, agility at an enterprise level the more it becomes a topic and you have to realign your HR services and, and practices with an actual mindset. Um, and this is how it typically starts. Uh, we have some kind of trigger and that's either um, that HR has this vision of moving into the 21st century or they have a specific challenge. Performance management, recruiting, uh, career models, um, something that they wanna 
want to address. And some of them do a full Agile HR assessment that they really go through all the processes and see, okay, how Agile are we actually in the way we are doing things. Um, others start with, um, with the initiate process uh, where they um, just really do this initial retrospective or backlog. Um, they do a lightweight business case where needed. They train and educate everyone, and I'm going to say a couple of words to that um, regarding that later on. And then they have a backlog um, refinement, and then they start to iterate. So even if we set that up, it has to be in a natural manner. We can't set it up as a project, as a waterfall project. Um, and then, of course, they have the option to pull the plug if they if they say, okay, we want to do something uh, something differently. But that's sort of the typical um, approach to, to people initiatives. And if you're interested in that, I have some follow-up slides or more detailed slides. If anyone wants them, just let me know. What are some things that are in that backlog? Um, that would be if you, for instance, wanted to change your um, recruitment process. Um, then we will first um, identify what are your issues. Why do you think you need to change that? Um, what are your metrics today? What do you want to achieve? Like, if you would write up a press release um, six months down the road, um, what would you? How would you explain uh, your your recruitment process, your talent acquisition process? And then we structure and say, okay, what are we going to change? How are we going to address that? Um, and what we often do is when we get to this, this initi uh, initiate stage is that we do an HR hackathon. So it's not a hackathon in the sense that we actually code something, but it's the idea of a hackathon that we invite um, employees to come on and say, okay, if you envision um, our HR department or people operations department two years from now, what would it look like? What would you want from your HR department? and how would you pull it off? And then they work in, the, in their teams to create new career solutions, to, to create new learning and development sessions. And then we partner up with HR to see, okay, that is the vision that employees have, or that's what they need from you. That's the voice of your customers. How are we gonna embed that? And then HR can come in and say, okay, we understand how the backbone works. We understand what it means if we pull a level uh, from our grading system, what, are, what effects do we have. But we still get the voice of, of the customers, of the people. Um, and here are some uh, quick tips that come from, from my experience um, in, in HR and actual HR. And I'm serious when I say this. You have to involve your HR people. You wouldn't believe how many Agile teams call me up and say, hey, can we do something with you? Can we change our HR practices? But we don't want to get HR involved. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem here is that sometimes they don't have the right contact within HR. So the person that they know in HR is maybe a recruiter um, or someone who is responsible for their payroll. And that may or may not be the right person. But it's the same thing if I need something from IT and I just know the first, uh, first level support guy, he may or may not be the right person to pull a natural transformation off. So you have to make sure to get the right person. And, and those people sit in the room here, so talk to them. And those are the people in, uh, who sit in talent management, compensation and benefits. Those are the analytical people in your organization, but those are not the people that you typically see or interact with. So find the right people. Um, and to do it, it and involve them. Then set them up for success. You wouldn't believe how many teams I see that set up a natural HR journey as a project, waterfall type project. They dedicate a team and say, okay, now you're gonna do agile HR um, and they meet once a week for an hour, that's it. It's not gonna fly and you're agile people. You know why it's not gonna fly. So make sure to set them up as you would any other agile project and um, to guide them through that, that journey. Give them a co an, HR, an actual coach. Sometimes we just see it's like, oh, we started it. It's now in, in the backyard of, of HR. It's not our issue anymore. Help them make that transition. Um, and then help them translate actual mindset into HR policies. Because as I mentioned before, it's not about setting them up in a scrum team. 
it's far more than that. It's bringing a natural mindset into the way they provide solutions into their practices, and that's a whole different scale. So we have to help them make that transition and translate that. And then cut them some slack. Remember what it was like for you getting started. And this is new territory for them. Agile is so, you, you all know how it works. You all know why it's great. But remember, they're just starting out. It's brand new for, uh, for them. And then let them have some fun. Organize open spaces and, and, and hackathons. Do things that transfer to show them the power of Agile. Because Agile, you have to experience it in order to get it. You can't just read up on it and say, OK, yeah, I got it. Sign it off. Um, and then understand that your organization has to find its own way of getting there. Because best practices are probably best at someone else's. Of course, you can look at what, other fi what things other companies do, but then make it yours. Don't just copy paste it. Um, sometimes the companies believe that if they just have an open space office, then they are a natural organization. Not quite. <laughs> so we have to make sure that uh, we get it, that we make it, um, make it ours. And remember, an investment in lean natural people operations is an investment in your people. This is not about HR. It's about you. It's about everyone in, in the organization. And to win the marketplace, you must first win the workplace. And in HR, we are in the people business. So we have to make sure that it's about people again. Thank you. Any questions? So first of all, thank you for joining us and thank you to everyone. Um, you were talking about recruitment and HR. Mm -hmm. I guess recruitment is part of HR, but let's be honest, until someone gets hired, the HR is not really there. Um, and I've been dealing with that recruitment in the last mm -hmm. month for different roles and different clients. I can start imagining how to try to do a job with recruitment. Um, maybe find a way to really, if we have multiple roles, maybe literally morning scrum as we call it and chat with them about the people we interview, where they're going to be interviewed, process. I don't know. Can think about that and start playing in my head right now. Um, how to bring that kind of HR to the side. So that's one note I want to mention. But HR I still think it's a bit of a different approach. I think that comes maybe from upper management or somebody else. Mm. But I don't really work with the HR the way I'm a day employee. So it's a different scenario. And I, don't, I haven't seen it in your presentation. The other challenge I wanted to ask you, and over the years of being a contract consultant and all these things over the years, I don't think it's the same scenarios for contracts, consultants, and full-timers. And being in all these, I can tell you it's very different feeling and discussion that you deal with HR, if it is the client HR, if it is your HR, if it is HR doesn't care about you because they only get the money and move on. <coughs> contract as well as you know. Or consulting where you just literally get ten percent, you get the concrete profit, you get you know, the paycheck. Mm -hmm. So how would you articulate this? Yes. Okay, let me just repeat that or, or summarize that for the people who are on, online. Uh, the comment or question was is that if we for instance look at hiring, that HR is not really there. They don't really get involved soon enough. But I can tell you from personal experience, and I'm sure the HR people in, in the room will, will back that up, it's not that HR doesn't want to get involved. It's the teams and management who don't really knock on the door of HR and say, hey, listen, we have here something. So it's, it's a combination of both. And we have to build that, that uh, culture of trust that we can actually work together and pull that off together. And of course, HR is going to have talent scouts who work within the organization, but also work outside, who join meetups like this to get to know people in the area in, who are experts in the area, so that once they have um, a position open, they will be able to connect with these people and say, hey, listen, are you interested, or do you know someone who might be, be the right person uh, to join? And then, of course, um, the whole hiring process is something that is guided by HR. They provide uh, the tools and, 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 and the access, but it's a joint effort. Like, the team is making the final decision on who to hire. 
uh, but of course HR will guide it and, and we're going to be more transparent in the whole process. So if someone comes um, to your office to be interviewed, they will get information beforehand. Who are they going to see? We're going to have pictures of the person they're actually going to meet. So it might sound simple or too common to do that, but it helps people to prepare for the interview and to know who are they actually going to meet and, and it gives you a different kind of interaction. Or simple things like just sending them a text message in the morning. Hey, you're probably on your way to our office. We're so looking forward to having you. And that gives a different kind of interaction. And HR is, is supporting that. It's going to come in to prepare <coughs> to help organize that and, and, and pull that off. So it's going to be a joint effort. And of course, you said there's a difference between uh, people coming in as full-time employees or part-time or consultants. Um, Yes, of course, there is a difference in the administrative side of it, but you should still feel as, as an employee of the organization and, and, and live and breathe with the organization, no matter whether you're a full or a part-time uh, part employee. But that's a cultural thing that we change. That has nothing to do with the administrative part. But I'm with you, it's today quite often an administrative part, but we have to translate that into the culture. Okay, any other questions? I noticed all your HR people still had suits on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll have to change that. <laughs> it's just no, a shop and stop suits. So first of all, uh, this was very innovative, and I, I, I like the, the concept. And uh, you mentioned earlier about the independencies between financial and legal. Mm -hmm. And in my personal experience, I mean, I've, I've had to change jobs because, you know, the governing practice of the organization is to keep expenses low, so therefore salaries and things like that impact, you know, uh, what kind of changes. And of course, the key to any successful agile transformation is leadership. So how do you go about getting that buy-in from finance and legal? Those two are the, you know, they kind of are the same type of people, right? How do you get those to buy into something that's agile, right? Because that's not hard and concrete, like mm -hmm. the law and numbers. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, the question was, um, how can we make sure to pull in finance, or how can we deal with, with the financial issue? And I'm going to say something that's not going to make me very popular with our HR people, uh, but we have to strip HR in order to strengthen it. So a lot of the things that we do today, like payroll, you don't need HR people to do payroll. So we're going to strip HR of, of all those administrative parts so that they can really focus on people. And budgeting is going to be a part of that. So we're going to move to an actual um, way of um, resource allocation and budgeting so that we don't have hiring freezes and, and that stuff anymore. Um, but it's a different, different way of approaching it. And um, HR is going to be stripped of certain things in order to strengthen it that they can really focus on the people and become people people. I'm just following up on his question mm -hmm. about the legal. So you did the finance, yeah. but you okay. the legal. Yeah, and the legal question, um, and that's my personal opinion, a lot of the lawsuits that we face, and um, let me just make a, a little uh, bracket here. If you are, even if you're a small company, you're liable for lawsuits. 40% of employee litigations are against companies with less than 100 employees. So it's not just something that happens to large organizations. If you are an organization with more than 10 people, you have a 12.5% chance of being sued by an employee. But a lot of it comes from not having an open, honest, proactive discussion. Because why do people um, file a lawsuit? Because they're they're frustrated, they're angry, they're fed up. And quite often, if we deal with certain issues before they arise, then we can t stay on top of that. And it's going to reduce the number of losses that we have. It's not going to be something that we, we can eliminate completely. But that's not the goal. The goal is to interact with people. Like, if you look at performance issues, um, sometimes we drag it out for years. And then all of a sudden, something happens, and we're as a manager, so annoyed that we just say, okay, now you're fired. And then, of course, the person is like, what? But I didn't do anything different that I didn't do the past five years. So, but if we address those performance issues heads on, say, hey, listen, I think we're on an issue here. Let's fix it. 
and if we can't fix it, we're going to help you transition, then we're going to reduce um, reduce those legal um, legal implications. I'm I'm convinced about that. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead. First of all, thank you. I come at this from an organizational change point, of view, mm -hmm. and um, I love everything you've said. But, and, and, and as I sound skeptical, <laughs> as, I, as I sound skeptical, this is not specifically about HR. Mm -hmm. You talked about an agile mindset, and you talked about honesty and openness and collaboration. I think those are what knowledge organizations, knowledge workers, that's how knowledge workers need to work. Yeah. But I put that on one side and I put a management mindset on the other side. And I can't, I mean, this is the challenge for me, mm -hmm. is, is how do we connect these two? So that how do you create a sort of agile HR, and I absolutely agree it's mm -hmm. what we need, yeah. within that, that waterfall of mentality mm -hmm. that is management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need all our requirements. We need to know what the deadline, you know, this, we need to mm -hmm. know when this is going to get that yes. sort of, we need to be able to measure it all as we go. Mm -hmm. so, yes. so that's my, that's mm -hmm. my challenge. Yes. Um, the question or the challenge is how do we align traditional management or the need for management um, with a natural mindset or, or actual HR? The answer is very simple. You can't. <laughs> Man but management has to change. But if you look at the beginnings of Agile, imagine you have never heard about Agile and someone pitches it to you. Well, you're supposed to let the team decide for themselves how much work they're going to do. Mm -hmm. It's never going to work. But I've never seen another way of working that is as accountable as Agile and as disciplined as Agile, even though it may not seem like that with a traditional mindset. Um, but you also know that it's sort of like in with a penny, in with a pound. Once you get started on that road, there is no way going back. And you immediately know, OK, we're onto something here. Um, and traditional um, management has to disappear. If you stick with it and if you think command and control is the way to go forward, do it. Stick with it, but you're not going to be successful. So you can't, and that's the thing about Agile HR, and the thing about Agile in general, you can't do one with another. Just having open space offices or having stickies up on the wall doesn't make an Agile team. And it's the same here. It's all in. Um, but managers realize that if we talk about the benefits, if we talk about the engagement that comes from, um, from Agile teams and how successful they are, you win them over with those arguments because they can't take that away. Um, sorry, I'll come to you later. Okay. There's also, I think, an obligation for us on the technology side to engage with HR, engage Absolutely. with legal, engage with finance. Countless times I've had people tell me, we have to do something brain dead because of legal. And then if you actually go to legal and you talk to legal, <laughs> frequently you find them saying, we never said that. We don't know where that's coming from. We can't kill the rumor. <laughs> so yeah. one of the things that's ironic, I mean, as agilists, we should be seeking communication, ideally face-to-face, -face, with some of the people outside of our, our individual units. And I think that's actually really a, a tough spot. I've had a lot of help from recruiters, speaking on the commercial side, not the government contracting side. But on the commercial side, usually our recruitment team from HR is, is really close to us. And our HR generalists can be very helpful. The legal team is often really, really helpful once you really engage them. But unfortunately, in a lot of corporate settings, uh, there's, there's just not enough of these conversations across wide business units. If you understand what their problems are in legal or finance, sometimes you can craft some solutions that help everybody. Uh, sometimes they then become very helpful wanting to, very desirous of helping you with your goals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, the common was that we really have to engage with people and talk to legal and, and HR in order to pull them in. So just invite them to your next um, PI planning or, or retrospective. Show them how great um, Agile is and connect with them. Absolutely agree that we have to pull them in and open up the discussion. And, but I find that, and IT people don't really like to hear that, that sometimes IT is very protective of Agile. 
it's, a, it's ours. Of course, we want the whole organization to solve our issues, and we don't want to do performance reviews and that stuff, but we still like to be the only ones who do Agile. So we have to open up and invite those people and tell them, hey, okay, it's going to change the face of our organization, but we're going to do, go that, that uh, extra mile with you. Absolutely agree with that comment. You know why yes. that is? You know why we uh, hold it safe? And that's because for the history of IT, we always get pointed at and said, you guys aren't doing things properly. <laughs> so yep. for once, we feel like we're having <laughs> some success. <laughs> right? That's true. Because business is always saying, oh, IT doesn't yeah. know what they're doing. But then <laughs> IT was the, the first one in the digital age. <laughs> you never had another age. <laughs> So you started out in digital age, so of course you have a certain advantage over us. Uh, but it's true that um, in organizations, IT is a little bit the, the naughty red-headed stepchild exactly. um, because we always have to do things differently and then come up with different solutions. But that's a role you have to take and help us uh, transition into the digital age too. Uh, so I don't know if the first gentleman had uh, sort of touches on this or not, but. Um, when you have a, a company or organization who operates more as a contractor versus like a consultant or um, as, as like you're a part, you're an employee of a company versus you're a contractor. When that contract ends, then your employment through that company sort of ends as well. So how do you, and, and that, I guess this is not exactly an agile question, but how do you retain, I guess, um, how do you retain the talent in a situation like that? And I guess the other question I had talked a little bit about agile um, HR in terms of hiring and retaining talent, but what if it what if the decision really should be that we need to let these folks or certain folks go if you're bottom performers? Is, is there an agile perspective to that? Um, Yes, there is. Let me just repeat very quickly what you, what you said. Um, the question or the comment was, is what, how do we engage contractors and or consult, external consultants um, if their contract runs out, uh, but we still want to keep them? And the second part was, um, how do we deal with, with people who we actually have to let go? And for whatever reason. Um, and the answer to the second part is very simple. We, f we follow the philosophy, hire slow, fire fast. Hiring slow doesn't mean that we take forever to, to, to hire people, but it means we have to be considerate and make sure that it's the right fit. And if you think like, well, yeah, it's kind of okay, then don't hire that person. You really have to be convinced that it's the right person. Um, but if you run into issues, whatever issues they are, performance related, behavior related, let them go. Or help them transition into a, another team. And even if it's someone who has been with your organization, with your team for a long time, and has done a, a fantastic job, but because for some reasons you don't need those particular skills anymore, help them make the transition. Either find something within the, the organization, and that's where the talent management team, um, talent scouts and career counselors come in because they know the organization, they will be able to point out if there are other teams that you need that particular skill, um, or help them transition into the outside world but make, help them make that transition and stay in contact with them. Because this, quite often people are actually glad when you tell them that it's not gonna work out because they know it too. Of course it comes to surprise when you just go in and say, okay, now you're fired. Uh, but when you have the dialogue, they are actually happy that you addressed it and that you helped them make the transition. And uh, give them a severance package, but let them, let them go. And that, I think that sort of like with the severance package comes back to your question about uh, return on investments, like salaries and, and how to calculate the cost of uh, employment. We also have to take into, into consideration how much it costs to get someone up to speed, to, to replace someone. And sometimes it's, it's a better return on investment to hire someone who's more expensive, more experienced than just hire um, young people that you have to educate. Those are costs that you have to calculate as well. For instance, Netflix only hires senior, uh, senior people because then they say, okay, we can let them make the decisions on their job because they're senior enough to know how it works. So these are return on investments that we have to, have to bring in. And the other part of your question was about uh, how to engage consultants. It's the same way that you would 
would interact and engage with other employees as well. Uh, but of course, you you sometimes have challenges um, getting them on board, or they might not want to move from a consultant contract into fixed term um, contract. But it's really about the dialogue and engaging with them and see what works for both sides. Any other questions? Two questions are, yeah, um, what kind of adoption? Are we at the 0.1% or the 1% or the 10%? Where are you overall kind of an adoption of this stuff? And the second, is there a correlation with having a title of chief talent officer? Okay, f uh, the first part is how many organizations yeah. are already transitioning. It's certainly the one more 1% 1 uh, than more. Um, but here is the thing. An agile journey is a learning journey. The sooner you start, the more you learn. So you can either wait another five years before you embark on that, um, or you get on board now and start doing it, even though you know, OK, we don't have all the answers. We don't know what it's going to look like, but we know how we're going to address it, and, and we're going to communicate that, and, and, and then iterate, and learn, and, 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 and improve. Uh, so it's certainly the 1%, but it's a reality. It's happening. And the sooner you get on, on board, the better. And here's the great thing. You don't go in and say, OK, we're just going to disrupt the whole HR department, and from tomorrow, everything is going to be different. It's a change. But if you look at performance management, if your organization is not ready to pull the plug, you can already say, OK, how would we do it if we could just do it on our own? And you do it. And then once a year, just, just aggregate all your feedbacks and, and send it into HR. So there are ways of approaching that and bringing in that agile mindset, being more transparent. Um, publish um, your, your KPIs in recruitment. How long does it take you to fill positions? Publish it. Make it visible to employees. And that really starts to change the behavior and the mindset in the organization. So there are different ways of approaching that. So it's more of a grassroots approach, uh, but it's something that is, it really works as well. From a legal perspective, <laughs> um, are you, where are there are contract situations, whether they're you know, long term, short term, um, are you finding that there are certain provisions that are helpful in you know, creating an understanding about uh, a quick firing um, or that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. um, I think it goes back to what the gentleman back here said talk to legal. And a lot of the things that we do are self-imposed rules and regulations. Um, it's more, OK, we want to be on the safe side. So that's why we're going to do things this way. But it's not a legal requirement. And um, when it comes uh, to firing people, um, if you give them a severance package, then in, usually you're covered. Sometimes laws are different for, for specific employees. Uh, but there are ways around that. You have to just talk to your, to your legal department, know what the situation is, and then the best thing is really have this, that honest discussion uh, with people. And even if you go in and say, hey, listen, we don't have a solution yet. That's what we try to, to, to figure out. Um, we're in contact with, with those experts to do that. Um, involve them and let them know what's happening so that it's not a surprise, uh, surprise to them. And then you can you can really find your, your own way. But a lot of the regulations and, and laws that we have and, and, and governance uh, regulations are sort of self-imposed. Typically, it's broader. And sometimes you have to go to the authorities and ask, how did you actually mean that paragraph? Why do you need that? And then you find ways around it. But you, you experience that in Agile as well with, with all government regulations in, in financial institutes. You find a natural way of doing it because you talk to the authorities of how to approach certain things and why they need certain data and then make sure to move together. Okay. What kind of time frame do you see organizations transforming their HR into an agile approach? Mm -hmm. the, the question was about the time frame. How long does it take uh, to transition? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a long-term project to transition the whole part, but there are certain things that you can do immediately. Like if you want to uh, try a hiring hackathon to see how that works for your teams, um, or have several teams hired together, because typically you have several teams hiring at the same time, pull the resources together. It's something you can do immediately. And you all know how quickly dynamics change in Agile. It's a f once the door is open and you step through it, then the world is, is, is different. So things start happening very quickly. Uh, but in order to sort of like 
dismantle everything and get it up to speed while you're still running the organization takes time. Absolutely. Okay. You talk about sort of the trigger of why people start. So, like, what are you seeing in terms of why HR departments will start? Because normally, you know, the, the best transitions we see are where you have like some agile, like lean leaders in place or people that's gone been from other worlds and come in to a certain organization and been able to help get things started. Mm -hmm. So what are you seeing like that's um, really that trigger, you know, that's a that's a or mm -hmm. you're seeing transform. Yes. What, how's that? Mm -hmm. The, um, the question was about the trigger, what actually triggers uh, and transformation. And th there are two, two different parts. Um, one is where we have strong agile teams. Um, they address these issues, say, hey, um, annual individual um, bonuses, they just don't work for, for our um, agile teams. They kill collaboration and, and productivity. Um, you can't keep up with, with our um, development needs and um, we don't have uh, typical uh, career roles anymore. So they address all those issues that they have. Um, but then we have the HR um, part that comes in and says, hey, we want to be in the 21st century. We want to be modern, but in HR we often approach it with a traditional mindset because that's the way we know. And when we start discussing a, a lot of the things, we fall back into the old thinking. And we always have that one person, the slacker, the bad employee, and we always have that person in mind and think, yeah, but it's not going to work for Pete. So what are we <laughs> going to do for Pete? And that is sort of like stopping us at the moment of just saying, okay, we have to let loose and just really push the reset button on, on a lot of the, of the things. And that's a hard change. And it's sometimes hard for people to stick with that actual mindset and not fall back into the traditional mindset. It even happens for actual teams. Even teams who are very experienced, once they get out of their comfort zone into a completely different topic, be it HR or finance, they fall back into the traditional corporate way of, of doing things. Um, so the trigger for HR is more moving into 21st century, solving issues like um, great talent pools or higher um, career models that are more accommodating. So they come from, from that, uh, that part. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you for the presentation. I wish like, the recruitment part would be is like 50%. <laughs> uh, but uh, in terms of this practice, practices, best practices, recruitment, mm -hmm. you say like top three best practices, like trends. Yeah. You, kind of, you mentioned mm -hmm. her, her song, yes. but they, like, usually kids, it's not not necessarily right people mm -hmm. Yes, um, it doesn't have to be hackathon in the sense of actually hacking it. Mm -hmm. What it means is get them into a room with your team and let them work on a challenge. And really work in a stress situation on a concrete topic. Because a lot of the assessments uh, that we have today are things like, okay, calculate how many ping pong balls fit into this room. Well, it's not really going to tell you that much whether that person is the right fit for that particular team. So involve your team and put them together to work on something that is highly related to your, uh, to, to the job. Instead of a panel, <laughs> panel interview? Yeah. Of course, you have a combination. You typically still do interviews, um, but you have to involve your team and you have to have a situation where you see people interact. Because um, have you, anyone who has ever done an interview, there are questions in there like, are you a team player? Have you ever had anyone in there saying, well, no, I kind of prefer to be in my cubicle and just work on my own, and I don't want to see anyone. And we know these people. They're out there. And we hire extroverts, people who are great at presenting. And we forget introverts who are great at the, the detailed stuff. Um, so we have to make sure to give them a platform where they actually work on something and interact with people over the space of half a day, a day, or even two days to actually see how they interact. And if the, if the team leaves and says, yeah, we want to have Anna in our team, then you get Anna. And if you have um, several teams competing for the resources, let them pitch. 
down and say, hey, Anna, we're the best team. We want you to join us because we work on this and that. And the, the next team says, hey, you're the team with the, most, with the most fun. Please join us. And then Anna can decide what team she wants to join. It's just a different, uh, different kind of in interaction. And another best practice is really the onboarding part that you engage with people once they sign the contract. You don't leave it until the time they actually sit in, in, in your office. Anna and Scott, when Chicago and Boston, you know, it's not easy to hack a phone or bring over an hour Yeah, but what we do is, once we say, okay, in a traditional recruiting setting, we would hire that person. That's the time point when we invite them to come and participate in that. And then, and then we invite them. Because it's, it's just one slide, it's our accommodation. It doesn't cost you that much. If you look at replacing someone who wasn't the right fit, costs you at least a one year salary. So you're easily looking at 100K. So flying them in from Chicago is not, is not a big deal. Yeah, con contractors. So so, yeah, and, yeah. But, and with contractors, we typically go through a company, so it's it's a different uh, different cycle. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, but you mentioned before, like, I thought you will say anything about like, how to you engage people before, far before mm -hmm. like, the position. Yeah, it's it's like really reaching out to com to a community, like come to, to events like this and, and, and connect with people and get to know people and, and or invite, uh, invite them to an event at your company. Did you just say, okay, uh, employees, we're gonna have an event. Um, if you wanna invite, each one can invite three people or whatever um, that they think might be interested in, in, in joining company someday. That there are different ways of, of engaging, uh, engaging with people as a take to really have that, that discussion. Um, Thank you. I take one last question, and then I'm going. You can just write to me. Yes, teams are, are definitely going to be interdisciplinary teams and, and iterate and the flow. Okay, thank you for the comment. Yeah, you just Google and go Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone, thank you so much. Opportunity. Where did Bill go? There he is. One more job. I'm sorry. Hey everybody, my name is Noah. I work for a web and technology company called Novomo. I need to hire a scrum master. Hopefully you're in the room today. Uh, I'm working on a federal government contract, a uh, great website, a science oriented uh, agency. Uh, fantastic team of people who have all the values you look for in scrum, um, but we need help kind of building out the framework a little bit more. So, um, I'm going to be over by the plants. Please come over and give us a All right, uh, Brian. All right, uh, on behalf of uh, DC Enterprise Agilist, DC Scrum, NCARB, and Excella, we'd like to present Great. you a nice Thank gift. Thank you so much. Thank you all Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. <laughs> HR, I definitely want to echo Jeff's comment, and my experience has certainly been that just go have that conversation. Damn the policy, go have the conversation and find out what the real need is. Um, also, we usually give out a book. Um, I was going to do the Rochambeau process of rock, paper, scissors, but I think we need to give Fabiola, who's never here, she's out of New York, so let's give her time. I figured, who here has a birthday on December 25th? Who has a birthday on December 24th or 26th? 23rd or 27th? <laughs> who's really close to Christmas? I already have the book. I no. Who's the closest birthday? That's what she thought. When's your birthday? January 4th. All right. Anybody closer than that? November 29th. What is it? Uh, November 29th. December. Yeah. November. I don't know. I'm looking for anything well, close to December 25th. Why does she say closest birthday comes in May? 
<laughs> no, I'm going with somebody who has a birthday during Christmas because I feel like you probably got screwed most of your life. There <laughs> 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 you go. <laughs> 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 Thank you also, Christine. Great facility and car. This is fantastic.